for Kumu Media's Policy, I'm Sash Nimuli. Joining me today is the veteran South African journalist and media personality, Jeremy Maggs, to unpack his book, My Final Answer. Your book is a hilarious account of your career through the years and during key moments in South Africa's recent history. Just give our viewers some insights into your early life um, from where you grew up to finding journalism by burning yourself with hot tea. I'm glad you asked the question about hot tea, uh, Sashni. And first of all, um, thank you very much for, for talking to me and also to your, your viewers as well. I was, I grew up in Johannesburg. I'm born and bred and I'm one of those people that didn't really have a particularly good idea about what I wanted to do with my life. So let me get to the hot tea story. First of all, I had a wonderful history teacher. I think it's really important in our lives that we all have a mentor of some sort. And funny enough, it's someone that I still keep in touch with to this day. Her name is Sue Kricher, and she was a magnificent, uh, she was a magnificent history teacher. And what she used to do, it was to invite a coterie of us to come around to her house uh, at a weekend to ostensibly discuss history. And I remember sitting in a group once and we were talking and we'd been served a cup of tea. I remember it was Earl Grey tea. I still have a negative feelings to, towards Earl Grey tea these days. The seat I was sitting on collapsed. I spilled hot tea in my, in, in my, in my groin. It was very painful. And um, I proceeded to make up a, a long story about the state of the wicker chair industry worldwide and problems with supply chain management. It was just a lot of nonsense that I was talking. And she looked at me and she said, Mags, have you ever thought about a career in journalism? And I think that, with other things, was probably the earliest spark I had. And I guess the rest is history because almost 40 years later, I'm still in one way or another practicing the craft. During the apartheid era, you, like so many others, were conscripted to the South African army, but you described this as having been a horrific experience. It was. Um, I, th I think I'd like to approach this from, from two avenues, if I can. Um, I did not come from a particularly politicized family, and I certainly acknowledge the advantage I had of white privilege growing up. Uh, my father um, had served in the Second World War, and he was very adamant that both his sons, I have a younger brother, uh, in one way or another, were going to go to the army. And I'll be very honest with you, we didn't, we, we had no political awakening as far as that was concerned. So um, I have said this publicly on many occasions before, and I will say it to you, and it's also in the book, it's not something that I'm particularly proud of, but it is my lived experience. It's something that I have to, uh, I have to shoulder now. So be that as it may, um, I took myself off or my father dropped me off um, for, for military training and I spent a horrendous two years uh, in the military. I was not suited to it. I had a tendency to question authority. I was overweight. Um, I was unfit. I was lazy uh, and I didn't enjoy myself at all. I guess the reality was is that uh, it was it was who I am. Uh, whether it shaped me or not, I don't think so. I hope not. It's something that I hope I have written about in the book with a, a degree of honesty, but I've also tried uh, to look for the humorous side in the whole process as well, as I do with many other chapters in my life. Tell us about how math failed you during your time at the Eastern Province Herald when you had to tally the A's from all the metro schools um, during the release of the metric results. One of the reasons why so many of us, and I, I don't know about you, uh, end up in, uh, in journalism is because we really are rubbish at maths. Through a process, I ended up on the Eastern Province Herald, as it was then in the mid-1980s. It's now the Herald. Uh, in the in the in the Nelson Mandela Bay Metro, and uh, one of the first jobs I was tasked with um, was to tally up the distinctions for the matric results at the end of the year. Now you have to understand that this was long before matric results were available online. So what used to happen was that uh, people started gathering outside newspaper house at uh, 11, 12 o'clock, waiting for the first edition to come off the presses. My job, uh, I had one job, uh, is that I had to tally up the distinctions from all the schools, but there was always a rivalry between two main schools. One was Theodore Herzl, the other was Gray. And uh, you'll have to read in the book 
um, which school came out top every year. But suffice it to say, I tallied these things up. It was simple arithmetic and I got it wrong. I got it badly wrong. And I remember walking into the newsroom the next day and the assistant editor, a curmudgeonly old man, looked at me. He was sitting at my desk and if memory serves correctly, he had a calculator, which he threw at me. I then had to make amends. However, having done that, uh, it was a useful lesson for young journalists, I think, because we don't pay attention to the smallest details sometimes. And what I've tried to do in this book is I've tried to make it uh, an amusing, self-deprecating journey through a very privileged and, 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 and magnificent uh, magnificently privileged career. Uh, I've been very lucky to be where I am. But what I've also tried to do is for, for younger journalists, as I guess I start to approach uh, the, the end zone as far as my journalism career is concerned, is to impart some knowledge. And my advice in that particular account that, that I give is one, you've got to concentrate on the small stuff. And the other thing is if you're involved in a new story, the same person uh, his name was John Edmonds, also said the first thing that happens with a big story is note the time. And that's something I've always done in my life. So if, they, if it's a big story, whether I've been on the scene of an accident, if I've arrived at the scene of a murder, if it's been a big political story, first thing I've always done, quick look at the wristwatch. What time am I there? And what time is the story taking place around? And I think that was a very useful lesson. You would ask me if my mathematics has improved over the years. The answer is no. And you met your wife, Anne, in the newsroom. Can you just tell us about your rivalry, uh, which eventually turned into love? I'm a fairly competitive person. I always have been in all my life. I'm not obsessively competitive, but I'm a competitive guy. So was Anne. Um, Anne um, was uh, a couple of months ahead of me on the junior rung at the Eastern Province Herald at, at, uh, at the time. And there was one night where we had to... Uh, we were both working on a, if memory serves, it was a Friday night. Uh, we were both on the late shift uh, and a particularly gruesome murder occurred in an outside area uh, called Blue Water Bay. I was immediately dispatched uh, to the scene of the crime. Anne was back in the newsroom. She was working the story, working the phones, trying to get as much information as we could. I procured as much information as I could on, at the crime scene. She got all the stuff that she needed. And now we sat down and we wrote the story beautifully, came together very, very quickly. However, one of the things that print newspaper journalists always uh, guard very uh, jealously is their byline. So I immediately wrote, by Jeremy Maggs and Anne Rogers. And Anne changed it. She looked at me, she said, that ain't happening. I did more work. She changed it to, by Ann Rogers and Jeremy Maggs. And we proceeded to have a fight in the newsroom. It's late on a Friday night now. I want you to understand that outside Newspaper House at the time, trucks are revving, waiting for the newspapers to be loaded as one more story has got to come off the printing presses. And eventually the chief sub-editor, the night editor, looked at both of us and took both our names off and put Herald Reporters. From that moment, um, I think Anne and I both knew that we had a connection and we have been married for coming up 35 years. It's been a long time. And I salute her for putting up with me. Um, moving away from print, in your book, when asked to choose between television and radio, you say that you prefer radio. Can you just tell our viewers why? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing. I've been very privileged. I have been, I've worked for a lot of frontline radio stations in South Africa. I started my career on uh, Talk Radio 702. I've worked for SAFM. I've worked for Power FM, and I love the intimacy of the microphone. I love the fact that uh, there's an old cliche about radio being theater of the mind. I've heard it so many times before, but I cannot find a better cliche. It's you in control of your own language. You're setting the story. You're managing the narrative. In many ways, you're in charge of the process, and uh, it is a one-on-one -on -one relationship between you and the listener. And I think if I have to default, radio will always be my first love. But I think I also make the point in the book that there is nothing more exciting than being a television anchor um, on a big story uh, that is breaking, whether it be a political story, a crime story, 
whatever the case is, and you're sitting behind that anchor desk and there's that flurry of activity that is happening. And you are, uh, you're not necessarily in charge because television has so many different component parts, but the fact is that you're holding it all together. You're like the conductor of an orchestra or the captain on a big airplane and, and, and you're flying this thing. And that's where television also gives me a thrill. But if you're forcing me into a corner and saying, what is my favorite? Sashni, I've got to say that um, I, I will always default to radio. And you also say in the book that there's far too much dependence on the PR industry right now. And you actually dabbled in what some journalists would call the dark side. Listen, I, I think that there is dependence on the public relations industry, and I'm going to shoot myself in the foot here slightly, because uh, soon after writing the book, um, I took a career decision to leave broadcasting. What have I done? Well, if you want to call it the dark arts, Ashley, you're very welcome to call it that. Um, but I have entered the world of, uh, of public relations and reputation management. I formed a new company called Bold. It's part of the uh, big brave group of, of, of communication uh, uh, units, and I'm very proud to be involved in that. But having said that, um, I think I still am right about it, is that uh, because of the depletion of uh, funding in newsrooms, not only in this country, but the world over, uh, there is a growing and there is a greater dependence on the public relations or reputation management industry or whatever you want to call it. I absolutely acknowledge that. Um, from where I sit right now as I talk to you, I'm quite happy that that is happening. But if I take a more dispassionate view of it, I would urge the media industry to be aware of it, to be aware of the power and the influence uh, that, the, uh, that the public relations industry wields, and that they need to be judicious in the way in which they deal with that industry. It always uh, horrifies me when I see a news release uh, that has been put out and all of a sudden, uh, it is repeated verbatim on the front page of a newspaper, for instance, or on a website. I think that's a dangerous thing. So I, I'm hoping, while, as you say, I have crossed to the other side, I, I am also hoping that there is, uh, that people in the journalism side of this equation are, um, are more cognizant of it and understand the unspoken rules. You finally got to interview former President Thabo Mbeki after six straight hours on air um, reporting on Nelson Mandela's death. What was the Mbeki interview like for you? Madiba had passed away and I had, along with my dear, dear colleague, and I call her my television wife, Iman Rapetti, who has also written the foreword to, to the book. We had worked from three hoppers three in the morning and we took the broadcast through until about uh, nine ten o'clock that day and it was it was it was sobering it was upsetting but it was also joyful in many ways so many people were coming into the station and paying tribute to, to nelson mandela but eventually you know our our, our broadcast uh, uh, stint ended and then we were told that um, former president uh, mbeki was uh, ready to uh, uh, ready to talk to us. We had put the request in a little bit earlier. And I remember arriving at, at, his, uh, at his home here in Johannesburg, and I was struck by two things. One was there was a big display cabinet behind him uh, that contained uh, a lot of uh, very expensive, I assume, uh, Cuban cigars. Um, I am not a smoker, uh, but I have been known from time to time uh, to accept a Cuban cigar. And I wondered myself there's so many here might he offer me a cuban cigar but he didn't but having said that the interview got off to a very bad start because i started the interview by referencing a comment that he'd made when he took over from nelson mandela as president of our country and someone had asked him whether he had uh, big shoes to fill and becky made a, a remark about uh, Mandela's ugly shoes and his shoes were always nicer or something along those lines. And I thought I'd start the interview with that line um, and it didn't go down well. Um, I had to skate very quickly to the next question. You also interviewed President Saul Ramaphosa when he was ANC Deputy President. What was your impression of him and what was that one question that you wished you had asked him so it's a, again um i've tried in this book uh, to be as honest as i can uh, about the mistakes that i've made because journalism uh, and particularly broadcast journalism 
is uh, a medium that moves very quickly and uh, you're always constrained by time. And this was after he, after the uh, Mangaung conference uh, where President uh, Zuma had been elected for a second term, President Ramaphosa, as he is now, had become deputy. Uh, again, we'd had a long, hard, hot conference uh, in uh, in Bloemfontein, and uh, at the very last minute, uh, we were told that uh, the then deputy president, Cyril Ramaphosa, was ready for um, ready to be interviewed. Um, we were given, I think, ten minutes. I regret not pushing him harder on his space that he occupied during the dreadful Marikana massacre. As you know, he was sitting on the board of Longman at the time, and there were some intemperate and inopportune emails, as I recall, that had been exchanged during the time. I wish I had pushed him a little harder on that, um, but uh, again, it's one of those things that I have to live with. I worked um, for many years, um, and I still do, um, with a, a, a veteran broadcaster, um, a person called Kate Turkington, uh, who always reminds me um, that the French have a wonderful expression, and I'm not going to go into the into the, uh, the providence of it, but uh, it's called the spirit of the staircase. And essentially what it is, is we all, in one way or another, half an hour after we have... Um, asked a question or we have given a reply to someone, we always think to ourselves, that's what I should have said. And I was halfway on the way back from Bloemfontein to Johannesburg and it was coming up to the Christmas break and I suddenly realized what I really should have asked him and how I should have pushed the interview. And I didn't. I would say to you as I answer this question that you show me any uh, journalist or interviewer who has not made a mistake or has not had the regrets about an interview uh, in their time, and I will show you a liar, because um, we all make mistakes all the time. In 1999, you met Britain's Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, and he was less than impressed less to learn than. that you were the host of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Um, tell us about that interaction and about your time on the show looking back. So, Sashni, first of all, um, I don't wish to disparage the dead because, as we know, Prince Philip died recently at the venerable age of 99. Uh, we all know that he was a formidable figure. He had an acerbic wit and uh, he was also known to put his foot into it. I was um, at a function, if I recall correctly, at uh, near the Market Theatre in Johannesburg, and I was one of a group of many, many people that were invited at the time to meet Her Majesty the Queen. And uh, he was always a, a couple of steps behind her as they snaked their way through um, a, a reception line. The Queen passed me, didn't say anything, but he stopped. I was introduced as Jeremy Maggs, who was then I just started hosting the, the, the television quiz show, uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And I made some remark to him about, you know, your, man, your, 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 your Highness, your Royal Highness, do you like it? And it was very sharp. Um, the exact words, well, you're going to have to read those in the book. Suffice it to say, he was not a fan of the show. And then he proceeded to ask me an impossibly complicated question about government environmental policy, which I seem to remember stumbling my way through, perspiring like anything, and wished I wasn't there. Having said that, though, um, I was very fortunate uh, to have hosted who wants to be a millionaire for just over 100 episodes, as I recall, um, in its time. And we're talking a long time ago. We're talking 20 years ago. At its time, it was uh, it was successful because there wasn't a quiz show on television at the time. And I also make the point in the book that um, the secret of its success was uh, something that one of the British producers of the program told me. It was a thing called shoutability, um, is that we were all sitting around uh, our television sets watching it and if you knew the answer at home uh, you would be able to uh, shout the answer out and then you would feel the pain uh, as the other person um, either got the question wrong or the joy when they got it right because the money ladder was fairly steep. I had a wonderful time doing it. Um, it's um, certainly changed my life. I was uh, you know very much a you know, a died in the wool print journalist at the time I, and radio journalist. And all of a sudden, you know, I was hosting this big show. Um, I have my, the show's executive producer, Anand Singh, 
uh, to thank for that. Um, Anand remains a, a dear and close friend of mine to this day. Uh, he was the, the producer of, of, of the Mandela biopic, um, Long Walk to Freedom. We stay in touch. It was a great time. Uh, I wish there were more quiz shows on television. Uh, they're not enough because um, I think the general knowledge is, uh, is a critical factor of just being a well-rounded person. We need more quiz shows. And Jeremy, you put emphasis um, on emotional assistance for journalists, including mental health. Why is this so important? When I started out, um, and I think this is a very important question, and, and, and thank you for honing in on that. When I started out um, all those years ago, journalism, particularly in the height of the death throes of apartheid uh, in the late 80s, um, it, was a, it was a gung-ho profession. Uh, you had... Um, people that uh, journalists, um, and I'm only answering this question from a journalism perspective, um, you had journalists who were putting their lives in danger every single day, being exposed to the most awful trauma, and there was little help at the time. The expectation was that you would do the story, you would come back, you'd either broadcast it or you would write it, uh, and then a lot of journalists either sunk into the, uh, the oblivion of, of drugs or alcohol. I know people now and people then who did that. These days, I think things have changed slightly. I think there is more cognizance of the importance of mental health and mental health management for journalists. Um, I'm not sure there's enough. I think that newsrooms need to be a lot more empathetic in that respect and understand the enormous stresses and strains on journalists that are in the field and are often to this day putting their their lives on the line. I think a lot more work needs to be done on the, in that respect. Uh, I think it's changing, but I don't think it's changing quick enough. And lastly, given the times that we live in, um, including the impact of social media, are you optimistic about the future of South African media? I'm very optimistic about the, the future of South African media. I've made the point, uh, I think, in the book and uh, on, on, a couple of, on a couple of other occasions uh, that Press freedom is something to be cherished. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is something that is fragile, that can be broken or bent very easily. And we all have a responsibility to guard it with our lives. It's always going to be challenged in, in, the, in, the, in the 80s and 90s when, when I was maybe at the height of my newspaper career. It was challenged then. It continues to be challenged now. I think it's up to all, all of us. Uh, to understand the privilege that we have as journalists, that we have to guard that independence as fiercely as possible, uh, to try and speak out uh, when there is a problem in that respect, and uh, to support each other. And I think that I'm, I'm very optimistic. You ask about social media. Um, I'm anxious and nervous about social media. I worry about the propensity of social media uh, to, uh, to spread false and fake news. And I think a lot of people get taken in by that. Um, I would, I believe that we that we need to be very judicious and very careful when it comes to social media management. Although these days there's nothing we can do to change that the, the trajectory. Um, social media has for all of us in many ways become a de facto first source of news. But I worry that it is open to abuse. But broadly, I am confident, positive, optimistic about South African media. We have some fine titles doing some really hard work in their respective spaces, yours included. And um, I would, as I look back on a very rich and wonderful life in the media, I would say that it's a great choice to make. Uh, you're not necessarily, though, going to make uh, a lot of money, but I don't think you go into journalism uh, because uh, you have that expectation. That was veteran South African journalist and media personality, Jeremy Maggs, unpacking his book, My Final Answer.